this is gonna be a fun job. We've got inbred Jed, Chad, Dover here. So these folks are gonna be building a shop right here. So all these nice furs coming down, we'll be able to we'll be able to fall everything here. So hopefully you'll be able to do a nice video showing all the fundamentals of tree felling, the various types of notches, try to be educational and fun. So I want to be really thorough, so check it out. This is a diameter tape. I'm going to get the diameter at breast height, DBH they call it, of every tree. And then this is a forestry laser, so I'll be shooting the height of all the trees. So I'll, I'll put that in so you know exactly how big these trees are. And so you know I'm not just guessing on my numbers. Oh, yeah. So this first tree is 145 feet tall. <laughs> yeah, that's a tall one. Is 31 inches in diameter. Alright, thanks Chad. Yep. Alright, tree number one coming up. So we're gonna leave tall stumps because they're gonna rip these over with the excavator. They want something to grab usually. You know, I would want to cut it lower. The lower, the better. I'm going to do a Humboldt notch. I'll explain that in a minute. See this line these are your felling sites right here you just look straight down and you know the tree will just be just a hair to the right of this line but that's a good indication you know, I got that big huge open field so I'm a little over a third of the way deep I'll start my back cut parallel with my notch put some wedges in as I go just bang it over incrementally and that'll be the death of the first one and this is why you want to saw with the full wrap handle because if I didn't have this full wrap handle I'd have to muscle it like this which is totally lame or I'd have to stand on the other side so because I have the full wrap handle I can stand on this side comfortably take your wedge and you just barely stick it in there and if the tree starts to sit back you'll see this wedge lift up and if the tree starts to go the right way hopefully the wedge will just the wedge will just fall out so if you just put it barely in there I'm gonna tap it in just to be safe but that will work too I'm gonna go to the other side because my bar is short and get that. I don't want to just keep cutting through because then I'll go through my face cut. Now that this side's done, I'm really close to the the face, I'm gonna come back here because I wanna be uphill from this thing when it goes. So now I'm gonna finish it off.
So see, this is what they call holding wood or hinge wood. And you see it's bent because as the tree goes over, this is what holds on and controls the momentum of the tree. If you want to bring the GoPro over here, Jed, just explain this a little bit. So you can see my bar was short right here, which is why I walked over to the other side. Um, if I, see what I was saying, if I just would have kept going, I would have ended up cutting through the front of my face cut, leaving this on, which would have been no good. You want about 10% is the rule of thumb across your hinge wood right here. Um, what else? But yeah, this is what controls the tree. And the most important thing by far when you're falling a tree is you don't want to cut this part of the tree, the hinge, because say I sever this off complete. Well, as soon as the hinge is severed, the tree just goes wherever gravity is taking it. And so you can kind of steer it too as it goes. Like if you leave more hinge on this side, this side will hold more which will steer the tree a little bit, you know, that way and vice versa. So this worked out. This is called a Humboldt, which is useful for both the application of, um, it makes the butt more likely to hit the ground first. So it's more likely to hit the ground, the butt first, rather than digging the tip into the ground. And also it makes the butt square. If I did a conventional notch, that would eat into the log. And that was the first tree. Now Jed will do the second one. And, uh, we'll get this cleaned up. It's a nice piece of wood. There's no root rod anywhere in here. It's just like a piece of furniture. Yeah, right on. Anything else you want to add about the Humboldt, Jed? No, it's a good explanation, I think. Jed's going to do this one. Tree number two. This one is 150 feet tall. This one's 26 inches in diameter. Uh, I want to try to cut a gapped face in this fir, which is I think what the old time timber cutters used to get really big trees over. My understanding was because the, the compression has to go somewhere. As that tree leans this way, all the compression is stacking up on the front part of the hinge. And I was told you'd save out more hinge wood if you uh, stacked that compression over a greater area of wood fiber before the bottom of the technically, technically, the scarf, I guess. No, snipe. There's two different openings, and the snipe would be from the bottom. So you knock out a gap, snipe the bottom. That's the idea. Dutchman out, which I've got just a hair bit of Dutchman in there. I'm probably not going to worry about it and just snipe this really open so that if this side hits first, and it's not going to, that's a ton of travel right there. But when you have really clear grain like that, you don't have to bang your guts out. Even a Mondo gap like that will pop right out. And you, that's really the best face I think that you can have. All right, so that's the gap cut. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just open this up a little bit more on that side just because we can. Okay. <laughs> directional face the downside is it takes a little bit longer so we usually don't use it we usually just try to match our cuts bang it out that's good enough for most of the shots that we need this gives you maximum travel but it's gonna hit the ground harder it's gonna bust more wood it's gonna drive more limbs into the ground 
um, not much, but the, a gentler Humboldt will shoot it out a little bit softer. But this will give you the most control? Most directional control. If you had a real critical shot, I would do that every time. side of the hinge also this is in compression as the tree goes over and this fiber is stretching and this is scrunching up really tight and so I was taught that that distributes the compression over a greater amount of wood fiber which is preferable and that th this this would indicate that so this actually pulled wood as it left it stacked up and then as it finally hit the ground and ripped away it actually took some of this on the tension side and it's interesting to me that it didn't pull any of that wood on the compression side. So that gives the log the greatest amount of travel, uh, directional control. The closing of the face is not constituting an impediment to the holding power of the holding wood. Once the face closes, you're breaking off all your holding power. And uh, how deep do you want to go when you're cutting a face cut? I stick to a third. You know, this was a head leaner. It, it leaned at the shot, you know, so yeah. no banging wedges just letting it go pretty much. Getting a wedge for security just in case. If it's windy, it's not today. Um, I stick to a third. There's a million reasons why pro cutters would want to go farther back. You, you see a lot of pro redwood fallers. They'll cut in at least 50%. But for me, I want room for my wedges and my guide bar. I don't want to tap, tap, cut, cut, tap, tap. That's really annoying. You bang out your chisels on your saw and, and you goof your wedges up and it's no fun. All right, cool. Yep. So that was the gap cut. So I guess this guy's next. Tree number three. Number three, this one is 149 feet tall, 29 inches in diameter at chest height. I'm gonna do a conventional face cut, conventional notch. And this is the most common uh, notch that people use to drop trees. The benefit to this is that for a lot of people, this is the easiest one to cut because the, you know, using gravity, the, the weight of the saw, it's easier to push it through, especially if your saw is dull. You know, um, that's a good way to do it. Uh, a lot of times I'll do a conventional when I want to get as low as humanly possible because that will give me the most wood to work with. So I'll, I'll do a conventional because you can get it lower than if you cut a Humboldt, you gotta be a little bit taller of a stump. So if I wanna get as low to the ground as possible on my cut, I'll do a conventional. The main benefit of the conventional notch, the reason most people use it, it's easier for most people to cut it that way. It works just fine for, you know, aiming and everything like that. So, um, all I can think of, this tree leans the right way too. Um, so I'm just gonna go a third of the way in and shouldn't need any wedges or anything. When I'm doing this, I like to, you know, figure my depth, and I like to dog in at a third, and that way I can just rotate the tip of my bar. I don't want to be jiggling my saw a whole bunch when I do this, because then I'll have inconsistent wood in the center. It'll be harder for me to speculate what exactly my wood looks like inside the cut. So just dog it in where you want it, and then rotate it, more or less.
other thing, so so my, my face cut is done. It's a conventional face cut or conventional notch. And you see how my, my corners meet up? Say I cut in and I had like a kerf here and the face cut went here. Well, that would be called a, a Dutchman, and which is super dangerous because, well, once that little gap closes, the hinge is likely to break and for all sorts of reasons, a Dutchman is, is dangerous and bad. You wanna make sure that your corners match up. It's a really common mistake. Sometimes people make their cut and they go, oh, that's good enough, but it's deceptive because you're not really aiming where you think you are if you've got that Dutchman in there. You, you have to clean that up. So say I cut my first cut here and then I'm going down. If my bar is going past it, if that makes sense, that is worth, so I could cut it and I could end up here or I could cut it and I could end up further back, back in better, here. Yeah, it's better if I end up here because that's cutting it short rather than long. Because if I cut it here, I can always bring my saw up and I can take more off. But if you go too far that way, now your directional cut is completely, it's aimed. Right at the house. Yeah, it's aimed in a, a different direction. So always keep in mind, it's better to be short than long when you're trying to cut this because you can always keep adjusting it. But eventually, you do want it to look like this where your corners match up with one another. It's a nice face. Thanks, man. out pretty well yeah to get shot thanks man yeah pretty rot so I'll show you one of the disadvantages to this the the conventional so if you remember these first two trees I did a humble and then he did his gap cut and both of these the logs landed and saved out pretty nice and then remember I did this so so the conventional as this closes it jumps up and the tip hits the ground first and then the butt. Whereas both of these cuts, when this breaks, the butt will hit the ground first, which will put the most of the impact of the tree on the thickest part of the wood. And so you remember we, we yeah. fell those two, the logs turned out pretty nice. And then I just did this conventional. One break, two breaks, three breaks. So I broke my log in three spots. Also, it makes it worse that my stump is high. If it were lower, the lower the stump, the softer it's gonna land because you have all this travel room right here to gain momentum and energy. But like I said, they gotta try to wiggle this out with the excavator. So they need something to grab, which is why we're leaving tall stumps on these. Whereas otherwise we would normally wanna do low stumps on these while we fall the trees. All right, this is tree number four. 26 inches in diameter and 140 feet tall. purpose of this this is a useful notch to know because the purpose so you probably have heard of barber chairing you know as a tree falls over too much pressure on a tree you know probably leaning the right way can cause the wood to fracture and split um, and this is something to really worry about especially with like weaker wooded softer trees like cottonwood and alder and stuff this is Douglas fir it is 
really not likely to barber chair. To, to actually get this tree to barber chair, I need to like put a monster truck on it and pull while I cut. Wood's really solid, uh, but it wouldn't be the world's best tree felling video if we didn't talk about all the cuts we could think of. So this is the bore cut. And what this does is I'm gonna plunge in, I'm gonna get my hinge wood set and then I'm gonna cut straight back. And what that will do is it'll allow the tree to hold on, the fibers on the back will hold the tree in place for as long as possible. That way when I sever it, the whole thing will fall over um, without barber chairing. The reason I don't do it that often is because as you're making your back cut, you know, once the tree starts to go over, it starts to tip over slowly and you can watch it from the back and you can, you know, kind of guide it. You know, if you cut more wood on this side, the tree's gonna steer a little more this way, cut more wood on this side, the tree's gonna steer a little that way. And as long as you don't cut through your holding wood, you have a little bit of control as it goes down. Now with the bore cut, while well, it's true that you mitigate the, you know, the potential problem of uh, the barber chair, you don't have as much control because once you get it set and you cut it back, it just pops and it goes right where you're aimed at. So that's why it's, it's not a very popular cut, at least over here. So. Uh, but I'm gonna do it and you're gonna see how the board cuts done. It, it leans pretty well in the direction that I want it. And so you gotta think if a tree is leaning heavy, you know, there's a lot of pressure on that stem. When you stick your saw in the back of it, you know, it, that too much force can cause, you know, uh, can cause it to barber chair, which can make for a really dangerous situation. I'm gonna plunge in and I'm gonna try to do it right here and leave in my, uh, get it cut to about 10% holding wood and then work my way back. strap will hold a lot of weight and the theory behind this is that all of the weight will be released at once instead of incrementally which might cause a potential for you know fracturing and barber chairing and stuff like that so I'll just zip right through it this thing should just fall where it where it's cut up to and that'll be that <laughs> Oh good. All right. So that was the bore cut. Hey, that worked pretty well. <laughs> yeah, one caveat on that. You can you can bore in um, a little bit behind where Jake was, like come into a, a real safe spot in here. And you still have plenty of backstrap. The tree's never gonna go anywhere, no matter how heavily it's leaning with about four inches of wood on the sapwood. You can bore in and then work your way up really carefully. Um, take your time on the far side, jog in and work. But that would have made more sense. <laughs> what huh? you did, it was way more manly. And I, yeah. Uh, yeah, that would have made more sense. But uh, you know, it's I, I don't use it, so I really shouldn't. Yeah, and it's worth noting, so the wood back here, so this would be tension wood, and this is compression wood. So you can imagine the wood holding here, it's like a guy wire, and this over here is like a prop. A little bit of wood here is way, way stronger than a little bit of wood mm -hmm. right here. Mm -hmm. So a little bit can hold a lot right here. This one is 139 feet tall, 22 inches in diameter. Well, kind of significant side lean to the house. If I hold this string right in the middle of the stump, I can see that it clears the string about two feet toward the house. See if I can get that. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, but what are you saying? All the limb weight is to the house, the top leads to the house, and then the trunk weight is also about two feet out of center from the, from the middle of the stump there. So there's a trick 
that I learned called the Siswell, which holds a lot more tension than an ordinary cutwood, so I'm gonna try to show that. Okay. And then also try to swing the tree off, off the Siswell a bit. So that would be an angled cut this way, and it tends to swing the tree like a door. Cool. Yeah. I cut a bit of a Dutchman there on my first cut. It's because I wanted to miss on the Dutchman side. You do not want a gap on your compression side because the tree can fail in torsion. You want to pinch here. You actually want to stack up compression here and not let the compression. This is why you don't do a full gapped face. So what we have is like a modified gapped face. This part has a gap. And if I want, I'll take and skank this little corner off here and that'll actually save that Siswell out a bit better. This part's gonna close first, and this is gonna hold like nobody's business. You can see the fiber pole once the tree's down. It it holds the world. If this were leaning any, hard than the, any harder than this, we'd have to put a rope in there and tie it 90 degrees over there to hold the side lean. It's just a nice trick when you're by the house. This is kind of borderline for me. I, I wouldn't really try to swing it uh, any more side lean than that. <laughs> all the side leans stacked up and you can see we pulled fiber down to the bottom of my cut there so instead of your tension just being all racked up on this one little bit of holding wood you've effectually spread it over a greater amount of wood fire it makes almost like a cable on your tension side I love this trick it can be overrated if you try to get away with murder but here and there it's it's really nice to use yeah you saw as the tree pulled sideways it even twisted a little bit and rolled yeah so it even rolled like that a little bit that held on real well Jed yeah that, that one worked out it, it swung the tree nicely and yeah. nice job man coming up tree number five and I'm gonna set a rope in this one show you how to pull a tree over with a rope pretty simple stuff I'm gonna set it with my throw ball. So I'm gonna take this, and I'm gonna set a rope. I don't need to set it, I don't need to set it crazy high. I'm just gonna set it uh, about 35 feet of this fur right here. We'll have loads of leverage with the skid steer. So this is the safest way to take down a tree by just setting a rope to it. Like that. Yeah. Take my rigging line. carabiner off because I don't want that to get stuck and all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna twist the rope that's a half hitch I'll do that like I don't know five times or something that's gonna stay on just fine Throw ball out, and we're 
we're just gonna tie a running bowline. gonna grab this winch line is it in free spin yeah. I'm gonna come over here show you a really handy knot this is a bolt on a bite so check this out just do a bite of rope how tall was it like that I haven't measured it oh. so you just do a bite like that bring it up like this see that stick the rope through here go around this whole thing pull that tight and that's a bolt on a bite really useful it can put a lot of weight on it it'll come it'll come right off when I'm done with this just gonna clip this guy here go ahead do over pull it tight we don't need a ton of pull this thing doesn't really lean back that hard so we're just gonna snug it up yeah it feels good man just taut you're pulling something over with a with a rope you don't want to put a whole bunch of pressure on it right away you just kind of want to hold the tree in place while you're getting cut up if you put too much force on it you can prematurely break the piece you know off of the stump so we're just going to get it snug chad is going to do this one and once it's cut up he's about at 10 percent on his hinge wood then we'll just have dover pull it right over this should go pretty well so Chad's gonna, what we're doing, Jed. yeah, you're gonna stretch that tree out, Chad. Okay. There. Yeah, you got a weird cat face here. We should explain we're holding these stumps really high for the hoe that they're gonna pull these out with a backhoe. So ordinarily we would come down a lot lower, say on a tree like that, it just gives you more room for wedges. Even though there's some flare in there, the grain's not quite as straight. Um, a bit of a cat face here, it's nothing to be concerned about. And then he's gonna cut it up here anyway. Chad, what do you think? Right in there, bud? so yeah we got a rope on her it may go just off a little wedge bang so see how this works out pruning anymore <laughs> nice job man oh man chad uh, usually works on the pruning crew so <laughs> he's pretty good at pruning i have to take him off the pruning crew he's an arborist and stuff pruning bigger ones now yeah <laughs> yeah he's pruning this one permanent. this is nice don't so, prune uh, jed what was the diameter on this uh 23 one inch bigger than the one i done so it's probably taller too <laughs> so i measured it it's 148 whoa but dover's at a nice safe 149 okay. oh well he's so. just dover anyways <laughs> so dover's good yeah he's saying i hate you <laughs> <laughs> so you're good dover <laughs> we'll just it up. all right so 23 yeah just get it snug buddy Yep. You know, just to make sure. You're plenty right now. You're really looking good here, but you know, you might take two more inches. Okay. You might bang it up bang, real bang tight. It right but as uh, as you want, if you don't have a lot of wood left, just let Dover know. He can just give it a tag. For sure. I'm trying to do it the all natural. Right. right. <laughs> Dude. Nice job, man. Well done. Nice. Fun stuff. Hey, look at your wood. <laughs> oh, yeah. that looks, dude, that's nice. I'm just a pruner, so. <laughs> oh my gosh. Nice job, Dover. So remember, my bowling on a bite. Look how easy this is to get undone. Look at that. Bada bing, bada boom. Nice job, buddy.
done. All right. All right, so we got two trees left. We just got these two guys right here. They both lean back pretty hard. I'll demonstrate an open face, and Jed's gonna do a back cut first on this one. Tricky one. I'll just have uh, Dover here push this over for me. Let me show you what a, a bad notch looks like real quick. This is an example, this is a bad face cut. This is bad because the depth is okay, but you see how narrow this opening is right here? So this thing is going to close, and once this closes, this tree is just gonna have moved a little bit and it's gonna be mostly standing upright. You don't want to fall stuff with these short notches because the whole idea of having this section of wood out here is so that as the tree, as the gap starts to close, your hinge wood is directing the tree where you want it to go. As soon as the face cut closes, it's game over. It just goes wherever gravity's taking it. That's why you want to have it to be, you, you want your face cut relatively open. And on a back leaning tree, you want it to be especially open because as this thing stands up, before it gets, once it's leaning where I want it to go, the face cut has to be large so that it has time to close all the way. If I just have it open a little bit, it's gonna, as soon as this thing closes, then, you know, the face cut's done operating. And by then, you just have to hope that you have enough momentum putting it the right way. So I'm gonna open this up and we're gonna push it over. So this is what we call so this is what we call an open face. And a disadvantage, the advantage to this is it's gonna close slowly so you'll have more control over a longer period of time. A disadvantage is the tip of this tree is gonna dig into the ground. Especially with our high stumps. Yeah, especially with the high stump. So we're gonna break it. Yeah, so the log is probably gonna break in a few spots, but I wanna do it anyways because this tree leans heavily back. And so I want this thing to be nice and open so it has lots of time close while Dover's pushing it over. And so that's the concept of open face cut. It's really useful when you have something leaning back. It has a long time to close. So I'm cut up to where I want to be. I'm going to that another smith. And now uh, Dover, go ahead and drive forward. Wow, that could blow it up. I was a little high on this side, but it all worked out the same. But you see what I mean? The face cut had a long time to close. If it would have been, uh, what would that be? Narrow or shallow or something? Narrow. If it would narrow. have been narrow. It would have closed as soon as you pushed it and then it could have broken and gone who knows where. So when they lean back, it's nice to have, you know, a lot of room to work with. Yep. So that was the open face. Let's uh, get this cleaned up. Missed another nail, Jig. Those oh, black look at that. marks are usually nails in there. Maybe there's nice. a mess right here. Weird. All right. All right, one more, and it's leaning back hard. We got the skid steer there for safety in case we need to push it over, but we're gonna demonstrate. So Jed's gonna demonstrate the back cut first method on this one. Before I do some stunt like this, just know I've got this big giant machine. So unless I cut my wood off on the hinge, I feel okay about doing this. You never wanna do this in the wind because it can take the tree before you're cut up on your face and now um, it's anyone's guess as to where it winds up getting barber chair out land on the house could be terrible. So don't do it in the wind Don't yeah. do it. If you're just starting out and cutting you can do it uh, When you're comfortable with uh, the more traditional stuff, I think 
So this tree leans back hard and you know, usually you'd come in and you do your notch first, but the problem is with all the weight being displaced back there, as you do this, you're losing this tension wood right here. So the tree wants to sit back naturally. So if you go too deep, obviously the tree's gonna start to go over. So what you can do is come in with your back cut first and get your wedges banged up. And that way those will stabilize the tree and then you can come in and do your face cut to your 10% or whatever. And then you'll be all cut up and then you can just keep banging it away. So should be done with extreme caution. Ideally you'd do something like this, you know, in the woods, you wouldn't have obstructions around here, but we've got the skid steer there for backup in case this isn't going well, we'll just push it over. So we feel safe, but we're gonna demonstrate how to do a backup first. This is a way to get a back leaning tree over with no rope. Yeah, it's really good to get that bark off if it acts as a bit of a sponge, takes your wedge power, and, and also can make you think you have a little bit more stump than you really have. The only thing that's going to be, the only compression, the only material that's going to have sufficient compression strength to push this that way off the wedges is, is the sapwood. The bark does nothing, it'll even impede you a little bit. Nice job, Jed. Hey, nice job, Jed. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, Jed's the man. Not the man, definitely. <laughs> Just Good that job, man. Rookie on that technique. So we saw a whole bunch of cuts today. Good job, everybody. Good yeah. job, Jed. That was. Yeah, you did really good. You too, Chad. Thanks. You did good. So did Dover. Good job, Dover. What? That five pounder is too much axe for me. <laughs> I can't swing that thing. We used a looks, mini sledge. You know? Yeah. It looks pretty good to me, man. So that's it. Hopefully, everybody uh, learned something from that. That was a fun day. What? So we got one more tree to clean up and then we're out of here. Saw all kinds of cuts. I think that's about it for all there is to know about you know, felling trees. I don't know about that. <laughs> that's all this rookie knows. Now you're first. That's all we know, yeah. <laughs> I should say. Well, nice job, guys. That was awesome. All right, good job, Dover. <laughs> All right, that's it. That's it for the world's greatest tree felling video. <laughs>